Let's see. Hello all, uh, welcome to the third uh, monthly Education 3.0 Research Network call. Uh, I'm Duncan Cox of Learning Economy. Chris couldn't be here today, but I'll be taking over for him. Uh, so as you know, uh, we're the Education 3.0 Research Network. We're gathering all these amazing nodes like last month's uh, call with the Trusted Learner Network um, and of course, today's Broward Open CLR call uh, featuring Dan Gole of Broward County Public Schools. Uh, just so you know, we are recording this call and we'll post this to our Learning Economy uh, YouTube channel after. Uh, the previous two calls are there. Before we launch into everything, I would like to announce that uh, in partnership with PCG, uh, Learning Economy Foundation is developing the T3 Innovation Network uh, interoperable learner record uh, hub. So what we're going to do um, is eventually invite all of you in there and we'll be uh, sharing resources there and kind of collaboratively creating this thing. But right now we're working with T3 and PCG to define the categories and working with a lot of our allies to, to figure out what this looks like. Uh, so for now, I'll turn it over to Greg. Oh, you want to unmute? Muted. Oops. There we go. Unmute my microphone. All right. Thank you, Duncan. Welcome, everyone. Um, so as many of folks know, since Friday, I've been working around the clock with an MIT-led idea that <clears throat> has rapidly evolved from a project to a global community and movement. Uh, just very briefly, the MIT Safe Paths uh, is a privacy-first, citizen-led, nonprofit movement to develop free open source tools for public health officials, infected patients, and healthy people to flatten the curve, reduce fear, and prevent the surveillance state. Um, simply, the idea is to provide a tool for public health officials and then to enable peer-to-peer -peer encrypted sharing of infected patient lo location history so that each of us can see uh, whether at some point in the last 28 days, the location information that remains on our phone shows a relevant time-space proximity match with an infected patient if anyone wants to learn more about that or wants to volunteer to help, it's a 100% volunteer effort at this point. Uh, you can go to safepaths.mit.edu uh, to learn more and volunteer. And so Safe Paths is both a meaningful response to COVID and it's closely aligned to our vision of Ed 3.0. Um, prior to uh, last week, we had been making tremendous progress with the Ed 3.0 vision. Um, our prior work with IMS, CASE, and CLR has provided the foundation for what we're doing with T3 and IEEE uh, related to ILR. Um, I want to stress that the public domain base document that we've, many of us have been working on together really brings together our very best thinking. And that is, um, in my mind, uh, the most important work that we could be doing, which is um, generating this clear uh, guidance based on uh, the best thinking that we can. Um, and so what we really need now most is implementers. Um, which I kind of been tracking as the ABCDs of you know, A is for ASU, which last month we heard from Phil Wong and his team about the ASU Trusted Learner Network. B is for Broward, which we're going to be talking today with Dan on the Broward Open CLR Lab. C is for the Colorado C Lab um, that a learn learning economy is heading up, and uh, hopefully next month we'll be able to get an update from them. And D is for the Digital Credential Consortium. Um, at MIT and uh, working with other universities, all of which with the, uh, with the uh, White House pilots and um, any other implementers that are coming towards the ILR hub um, will be uh, summarized in best practices in the IEEE ILR recommended practices document and brought together in this community ILR hub. So um, with that, we wanna really kind of dive in on the B Broward um, and uh, Dan, uh, if you can, you know, obviously this is not a normal day, not a normal week. Um, it's impossible to talk about any of these things without thinking first about the COVID crisis. Um, so maybe you can just kind of, I was thinking kind of three questions that, you know, kind of prompt you on of, you know, first, how are you dealing with this COVID crisis? Because I think everyone wants to hear that. And then second, what do you think that means about the future of uh, learning models? And how does it change or amplify or slow? Uh, the work we've been doing and then connect it back to the actual work we've been doing in the open clr lab and then joshua's going to get into some additional detail on that so dan how are you dealing with the crisis 
Well, Greg, thank you so for uh, queuing me up so well. And good afternoon to those on the East Coast, morning to those elsewhere. Um, Broward County Public Schools, like all public school system around the country, is adapting to its local conditions with rapidly changing general guidance. So just a little bit of history on Friday uh, afternoon, Broward County Public Schools coordinated with Miami-Dade Public Schools to the south and Palm Beach Public Schools to the north to simultaneously announce that it would begin closing schools this past Monday, March 16th. Um, for us, it was less of an impact instructionally because we already had a strange week where we were going to only have two and a half days of instruction because of the primary elections in Florida. We were closed for students. Friday was already a scheduled work day for teachers only. And Thursday was what we call an early release day for teachers to turn in grades um, for the end of the quarter. So students at this point have only lost two and a half days of instruction. Next week is our spring break. So we knew that we were effectively buying ourselves till Monday, March 30th. And I'll go into what will be happening on that day moving forward. This week was about prepping for that, but immediately dealing with um, some broader community concerns that the schools provide. First and foremost, we're not just instructional providers, we provide meals. And so setting up food distribution networks across the county to provide uh, free meals for students. Uh, we did not open every school. We created hubs around the communities by overlaying uh, maps of our food deserts with our schools, making sure we had some presence in every community, but concentrated presence in those where we know there are challenges to even getting to a high quality grocery store. Um, so that was set up and done. Additionally, we have childcare issues. So while we may be closed, and some parents have the ability to find childcare, it was critical that our hospital workers, doctors, nurses, and those who are first line responders continue to have some degree of um, childcare maintenance, uh, which is also a function which schools serve as, while those parents continue being frontline against the pandemic. Um, so we stood up childcare uh, by concentrating those sites next to large medical facilities um, here in the county. And then we needed to address instruction on the 30th. So we had three layers that we needed to address. One is content, and I'll spend most of my remarks in a couple of minutes because it connects directly with the CLR work, talking about how we will provide instruction and operate schooling on the 30th. But we can only do that in a digital, virtual, online environment if two other criteria are met. Those are, one, students have to have a device, and secondly, there must be connectivity because connecting the remote instruction, both the teacher and the activities, the content, requires the device to connect to the content. We today have distributed um, we will, we have 100,000 devices available for kids to come and pick up who are going to their individual schools. We are not trying to provide a device to every one of our 280,000 students. We are trying to close the gap so that families who do not have a device at home or families who do not have sufficient devices are coming in and checking these out as loaner machines. It really highlights our delay in moving to issuing a device to students the way that schools have historically issued textbooks. Um, we've been trying to stand that up. It is a financial uh, challenge at a district of our size to do that. Um, but it really has highlighted if we were there, this would be The last thing is the connectivity. We're working with the internet service providers in our community. Comcast primarily, they have opened up all their Wi-Fi uh, service or hotspots. They also have an at-home uh, program for students on free and reduced lunch where they can get a wireless mo Wi-Fi modem installed. Um, they've modified their terms and conditions. It's now 60 days for free and then the $10 a month kicks in. 
and uh, it's just getting those delivered to people's homes on time uh, for the 30th that is going to prove to be a challenge. We are also looking at the possibility of issuing hotspots as loaner devices um, to close that third tier gap. Families that don't have any device and don't qualify for the internet um, essentials program by Comcast. AT&T also is a provider. Um, their terms are a little different. They don't cover quite the same area within the county. But this three layer tier of approach of content, device, and connectivity is what we're doing. Um, what I'll now turn to is what's gonna happen on the 30th. Many school districts have published schedules for students um, of activities and made students aware of the kinds of applications which may be available to them and told kids spend you know, X 30 minutes on this program and an hour on this program. That is not the approach we are taking. Because we had already deployed a learning management system, in our case, the Canvas product by Instructure, we have a common platform for school to operate. So imagine lifting from the physical space into the virtual space all of schooling. That is our broad ambition that we will be delivering on March 30th. In order to do that, we needed to make sure that our moderately placed rollout that has had most of our teachers get onto Canvas got stood up immediately for all of our teachers to be on Canvas. We've put, beginning on Wednesday, multiple online training programs, video, uh, Canvas course, open Canvas courses. There was a broadcast TV training session that's running today. We're running live streams through Microsoft Teams for teachers to join, 250 at a time. Lots of layers of support. We're using Yammer groups, we're using uh, text trees, we're doing all kinds of things to get the teachers up so that the following will be how kids go to school on Monday. They will go on to their district login as if they were entering the school door. That takes them through single sign-on to their landing page. We call it their launch pad. The launch pad is that browser-based digital space where they see all the applications which have been provisioned for them. They're now at school, and we'll be able to take school-based attendance through Clever that they have arrived at school. Then they will go to their classes. For elementary students, it's one class with maybe some specials of art or physical education. Those are separate courses on their Canvas page but they go to school through single sign-on, they go to class through Canvas. And we believe that we will be able to provide what I'll call baseline tier one instruction. We have signed an agreement with the Broward Teachers Union where teachers will spend up to three hours a day online live chatting with students Microsoft Teams, which as of Wednesday of this week, we have connected with Canvas. That agreement was signed by Instructure and Microsoft on Tuesday afternoon. So we were about 12 hours into that possibility when we deployed it, and we've been testing it through the week. Um, it's only 48, 50 hours ago, but we've come a long way. Um, while we could run the master schedule, periods one through four at the times, there's a tension. Teachers are at home. They have their own kids. They may not be able to meet at two o'clock because of the demands in their own world. So balancing this professional and personal world has led us to this compromise where teachers will be a minimum of three hours. They can be more. They're gonna post office hours for availability for kids. So that is now a truly blended environment of synchronous live interaction mediated through Teams and Canvas-based asynchronous activities with the provisioned applications of uh, vocabulary.com or iReady or all those other tools and assets 
with kids being able to submit work. The next tier is special services, special education, counseling services, social work services. All of those also need to be uh, provided in a virtual space. We're thinking through how do we provide suicidal ideation support? How do we address uh, hard of hearing support? That is maturing. I'm confident that some degree of that will be able to be delivered by the 30th. Our working conditions at this point are as follows. We've been told to remain closed until at least April 15th. We do not believe that we will be returning to school after that. We believe that it will be longer. So we are preparing as if the rest of the school year will be done virtually. So this raises the question of grades and how do we know what kids have learned and how do we know whether or not kids have done things, which directly connects with the intention of an individual learner record or a comprehensive learner record, whatever we're doing. We will be able to gather grades through Canvas and submit them to a grade book in the traditional way. But more than ever, it is important to capture the other skills and the nuances and the connection of how does that grade have a meaning? What's behind it? On what basis or criteria is this, this grade, what's it asserting? And so the, the development of comprehensive learner records are really powerful right now, particularly as we try and think through clubs and other activities that we're also gonna have to be providing. So I wanna spend just a minute and then I'm gonna hand it to Josh to talk about what it is we're trying to do with comprehensive learner records here in Broward. We want to empower students to have the documentation of their effort, their work, their engagement, and their experiences in such a manner that it doesn't have to be reduced to the traditional report card transcript modalities that schooling has provided, where all of that is only official in the hands of the institution. We want to provide a signed envelope of the back, the way registrars used to have to sign the envelope that it was a sealed transcript through a wallet that's digitally signed so that there is no need to have the institution serve as the hub for verification. And we want verification to be at a fairly granular level to some extent do you know how to do fractions? Do you know how to do polynomials in math? Do you know poetry or can you write five paragraph essays? But all of those need to then be aggregated into these larger units that we call courses or diplomas. But we also wanna overlay on there the social emotional skills, the exposures of mindfulness, the ability to work well with others, project-based learning, and all of those things. So we're working with our career and tech ed folks on external certifications. And then for our special needs learners and our English language learners, they have their own uh, vocabulary and ontology of what defines their skills and how those skills have been assessed. All of that should be able to be packaged, handed, and be able to be carried as currency by students. And I'm gonna pause my monologue because I'm sure we'll come back a lot of these points. So, Greg, did I do okay? Excellent. Well, you, I, I'm amazing. And it's just, I want to thank you for your leadership. It's incredible what you've been able to pull together in this short period of time. Oh, um, it's other people's work. I'm just the mouthpiece. So. And I don't know how this compares to the challenges that the other 15,000 school districts are trying to meet. I'm sure that they're all trying to do similar things now. Um, and so, um, you answered the three questions that I asked, which is what are you doing to, uh, in this crisis? And um, is this going to uh, accelerate or delay the progression towards um, more comprehensive learner records? And how does it relate to that? So um, I guess I'll just ask one more question before pulling it over, uh, turning it over to Joshua. So what is the biggest challenge that you face now? <clears throat> Given what you laid out, um, when you, you know, when you woke up this morning, you thought, oh, that's the thing we got to work on. What was it? So I'm going to give you two answers. One is we have never been, we have never load tested the ability of the system to process 
you know, more than a quarter million logons within a 30, 60 minute window. I really worry about the, the ability of the system to process all these requests. That is the bottleneck. And it's both on the single sign-on side and then on the Canvas side, right? Yeah. Um, so that's my biggest worry that the system will just crash and nobody will be able to get in the school door, hmm. right? The second piece is going to be that the experience that kids have is so frustrating on days one and two that they're unwilling to engage in day three and beyond. We've got to iron out the wrinkles of implementation very quickly. So we're trying to pace guidance to students, parents, and teachers in such a way that they don't feel that they have a tsunami of information that they're expected to know all at once. Um, you know, clearly we've honed our message about what it is they should do to this very succinct piece, but there's a lot of nuances and unique circumstances that we're going to have to be rolling out. With spring break being next week, we're going to try and do a slow cadence of further communication. Um, and I'll, I'll share with everyone that we need people to be patient and positive because this can be done. And it's going to be different. But we can move to a full-on blended model even if the blended is in the environment of social distancing, it need not be social isolation. Hmm. And qualitatively, what I keep returning to is the feeling of ensuring social connectedness and relationship maintenance of the students and teachers. That's why we chose not to go with the um, litany of scheduled activities for kids to do on their own. We really want the human relationship to be retained during this time. And that's, that's yet to be delivered, but it's what we're striving for. Well, we, the community here, you know, stand with you. And, you know, I think we all want to help in any way that we can. Um, and, you know, part of that is, uh, tapping the collective intelligence and expertise that has been participating in Ed 3.0 to create this base document that helps us um, not just do case and CLR, but put it inside of verifiable credential packages and enable it to be owned in self-sovereign control in digital wallets. Um, so, yeah, so like I would love if we had, if we were six, eight months down the road from where we are now with the CLR work, I could tell people that we can give band credit based on a teacher having watched a video of performance, right? Right now, people are asking, how are you doing PE? I mean, there's all these weird pieces, but it's the special ed and other things that our traditional grading system fails miserably at that CLRs give us the flexibility to address with nuance. But that's Joshua's expertise. He's been working us through the ELA and math as our first and, um, let me sneak just one last question in maybe before um, Joshua, um, which is if we take this video that we're watching right now and we send it to foundation funders, um, do you have a message for them about what they could do to help you? Do you feel like additional resources could accelerate the type of work that you just described? Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that then. <laughs> <laughs> and they should call you, right? They know your phone number and they should call you and they should uh, help out, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Joshua, do you want to take it over and kind of drill down one level of detail about uh, what we've been doing there in Broward? Yeah, uh, but in, in deep appreciation for the Maslow-like architecture of your monologue, Dan, uh, I, I'd like to transition elegantly to the conversation of the plumbing and the mechanics because I am a thousand percent with you. This this thing happened a year too early. If if we were a year hence and we were able to award achievement uh, badges and achievement assertions for students through a workflow process uh, initiated by students and teachers in, in a more 
um, blended and personalized competency-based way, you would be in a strong position to evolve the methodologies and pedagogies underlying your instructional approach. And that's sort of the transitional question I want to ask you, and I'll try and weave into my presentation. How do you see this change to a blended approach forcing everybody to reconsider their methods and practices and, and pedagogy associated with instruction? Because, you know, everything you do is based on the classroom book factory model, and now we're not there anymore, and something has to change. So the first thing that we're having to get, and we were able to get our um, collective bargaining agent, the Broward Teachers Union, to concur with us on this. You know, they're rightfully fighting for working conditions and academic freedom and flexibility on the teacher side. Teachers use all kinds of other tools, right? Remind and all those other apps. Everybody's got to be on the same tool set so that we can engage people in a similar way. That does not have to displace the things they're doing with these other tools. They can continue to use those, but we must have everyone connected so that we don't have separation of um, analytics, of uh, quality assurance. Um, so we're trying to do that. Secondly, we need people to realize that now more than ever is the time to be generous, compassionate, and share. Teachers have um, unfortunately been forced into a little bit of selfish behavior given the way in which bonuses are awarded. And now that state testing has been lifted, not only in Broward, not only in the state of Florida, but today the USDOE announced that all states are being granted flexibility under ESSA to lift state testing. Local conditions, local requirements, local definitions of what good learning is are applying. If we're going to have 15,000 school districts with how many hundreds of thousands of schools and classrooms, you know, millions of classrooms operating, we need a common way of exchanging information that doesn't necessarily have to use the same currency, but those currencies must be exchangeable. This speaks to the importance of case and so that we can map skills and standards across jurisdictions, not just in the academic realms, but in the social emotional, in the other realms. We, we've got to agree that creativity is not stymied by having small s standards. We need to have the kinds of data dictionaries, uh, a NIST, National Institutes for Science and Technology-like approach of what are the definitions of the atoms of all these other things we're going to be building and expressing. And it's now architecting engineering and art simultaneously. So Joshua, I don't know if that's responsive, but. Totally, and it, you know, it gives me a good point of, of transition. Um, so I'll take that opportunity. Um, so as Greg mentioned in the introduction and, and as Dan alluded to repeatedly in his presentation, we've been working uh, for most of this year, as it exists, uh, to consider and to design a comprehensive learner record strategy uh, for Broward and um, to implement this picture. So this picture represents um, the information currently managed within Broward uh, and the information available that could be used to create a comprehensive learner record that that tracks the student's mastery at the skill level as opposed to simply tracking their completion of courses with grades. So um, you can think of this as the comprehensive learner record database that contains the data that's generated by systems and educators within the system. Uh, we have, you know, the summative assessments like the PSAT, which gives us uh, category, reporting category, and percentile score. So it gives us some information. How are they doing in the general areas of math and language arts that are the challenges for matriculation? Uh, the learning management system, uh, which generates the score reports that go into the gradebook. And these are the assignments that, that go on throughout the day. 
Um, and the teacher also does that through their traditional gradebook. So those two different ways. You can get and get it through the learning management system or they can just simply enter the grades from their traditional grade book a piece of paper into the Pinnacle gradebook system. Uh, there's also formative assessment tools that use within Broward and uh, particularly we've been exploring the use of Mastery Connect uh, to generate standards-based performance uh, reports and assertions uh, that can also be collected. And then there's uh, a bunch of co-curricular and response to intervention kinds of information that are collected uh, and managed within other systems that can also be brought into this Broward CLR. The goal is to collect this information and show that the student has in fact mastered all of those skills as opposed to simply passing the requirements for the course and maybe not mastering some of the core underlying skills in the process. Uh, sufficient so that the student can take that information and share it with the community college or their, their next uh, school and convince them that they're ready uh, to take credit bearing course. The challenge uh, in Broward uh, is that of the college bound students, 50% of them uh, go to Broward Community College, uh, local community college. And of those 50%, half of those are unable to pass some portion of the AccuPlacer assessment, uh, which uh, is required for them to uh, take credit bearing uh, courses in their freshman year. And what is a sad fact is students who are uh, forced to take remediation courses in their freshman year are very unlikely to the tune of only 6% to ever get any degree. So the, the goal of this is to see if there is some way to intervene and provide targeted uh, intervention, remediation, and enrichment to assure and affect that sad percentage of students unable to, to complete their college work. So to do that, uh, we start to analyze the available data and how to tease out latent information that's in the existing workflow and data. So you can sort of think about it this way. There's the course achievements where you have course grades. There's the competencies and skills that you get out of your assessments where you can see whether you're exactly on level above or below as some percentile score. Uh, there's the other assessments like the PSAT, the FCAT, that generate other kinds of scale scores. And then there's all manner of co-curricular tools like Delta Math and Khan Academy on the math side that can generate assertions. But how do you make sense of all of that data? It all starts with the expectations. Uh, so in Florida, the state of Florida publishes their standards uh, in, uh, in a PDF document. Uh, but we are, have been working with uh, the state and with uh, uh, a group called CPOMS, which publishes the standards for the state to instead, or in addition, publish these expectations of learning at each grade level, what you're supposed to know in each of the topics within a, a domain. So math, grade eight contains number systems, expressions, and so forth. Uh, this is going to be, uh, actually at this very moment, is being um, made available in IMS Global case format in a machine readable form that we can load into systems and we can use identifiers to link to in a linked data way. That is pouring the foundation of our Maslow's hierarchy of, of data interoperability. So within Broward, we've been working diligently with Dan, uh, with Dan and his math team and separately his ELA team to articulate their scope and sequence, the order in which they teach topics into another framework, what we call a scope and sequence framework. So we see that in Broward, they teach algebra in a course, you know, in a course sequence that starts with uh, pre-algebra and goes on to algebra one and algebra two, and there's different forms of those courses. Each course is broken up into a number of quarters, and each quarter is broken up into a number of units, and each unit covers a set of major cluster skills. These are the primary things that the student is supposed to master and be able to apply in a number of different contexts uh, as they go through uh, their progression. So they, you know, by the time they complete unit one, all of these skills should be 
completed and mastered and be able to be built upon. And then there's additional supporting skills and additional clusters where students are being introduced to concepts but are not expected to master them. But these uh, introductions of the concepts are the points at which you start to build proficiency in understanding those concepts. So now we have the expectations, what they're supposed to know at the end of instruction. We have the, the progression, the sequence in which they learn and master them. Now we need to get to what is it they actually need to know at the end of the pipeline. So at the end of the pipeline, you know, the primary uh, gate is this AccuPlacer assessment. So we did an analysis of the AccuPlacer assessment and we said, well, what are the content areas that are defined in the test and what do they need to demonstrate in the test to be able to pass these parts of the test? And we did the exact same alignment. We aligned these AccuPlacer domains back to the expectations. So now we have the scope and sequence aligned to the expectations. We have the assessment gate to the next uh, level of learning defined in those same expectations, uh, which leads us to a way to equate readiness. So we can take a look at the uh, collection of all of this data, and I'll show you exactly what this data looks like. Uh, we model real data in this case format uh, for Broward, and you know it's, it's a little tweaky here, but what you can see is uh, it's a sequence or a log of activities, and, and for those folks on the uh, ADL XAPI side, we'll see this very clearly as a set of XAPI achievements. You know, in in the CLR world, we we call these achievements. In the XAPI world, they and they call them um, uh, activities, um, and activities have profiles and can be achieved. So it's essentially the same model. So the student can enroll in a course section, right? And what we have here is a definition of achievement. It's an enrollment achievement. The enrollment comes from the student information system. It's an enrollment into the course named this thing. It has no requirements for the enrollment other than to be enrolled. And then it's aligned to a specific skill. In this case, the skill is the course for Algebra 1 in a case framework. So this is a linked data expression that says, not only do I know that they uh, enrolled in a course called Algebra, I know absolutely everything about what Algebra teaches, all of the units of instruction, all of the related major clusters, and I can explore all of those relationships as linked data in the open. So when the student shares this record with the college, they can say, oh, not only did they pass Algebra, what does it mean to pass Algebra where that student took Algebra? As they progress through, in this case, the student is enrolled in an English language learner group and as a result gets additional um, uh, objectives that they can meet associated with mastering the language associated with math. Um, then each of the units of instruction has an achievement as well. So you not only know that they got a, an A in unit one or a C or an, in this case a D, right, so they didn't quite do as well, in this achievement, you can say, all right, well, what is it that they showed a D on? And they can, you can say at the end of the quarter, perhaps, okay, these are the skills the student didn't actually master. Let me put that in a list of, of enrichment activities for the student so that we can make sure to uh, bolster and reinforce these skills as they continue through their learning or provide a connection to an after-school program uh, through the local community uh, supports. Uh, or the library services or PCG's uh, tutoring services uh, to reinforce the skills that were not demonstrated here to make sure that you know the progression of these grades continues to look good and doesn't look like this, which is not so good. Additionally, in this sequence, you'll find that there, there are some key other pieces of information that flow into the system. Uh, there are assessments that go on throughout this uh, instructional sequence, formative and interim assessments. And those assessments generate performance reports. And in this case, we're able to capture all of the information about the student's performance on a set of skills assessed. So in this case, we have four different skills that are assessed at four different levels of proficiency. And the student is then graded and scored on each of those. So you can capture the fine-grained skills as well as an output of an assessment uh, as
as part of one of these records. And then similarly, this is the PSAT, where we have 16 different reporting categories that either have a scale score or a raw score, and then there's a definition of what those scale scores and raw scores mean. And then over the summer, there's additional things that go on. The, the student can take uh, after school programs. Um, so, uh, complete course grade here, uh, graduates from middle school, gets a summer school computer science certificate, right? So, this can be in like an open badge certificate awarded by a science summer school program that is endorsed by Broward that confers some credit or prerequisite. Uh, for their learning pathway within Broward. In this case, this is student completes co-curricular community service of 100 hours of service with a, with a badge class award. So what you're seeing here is, you know, this is the data that sits inside the record that will enable uh, Broward to uh, measure the student's progress uh, throughout, the, throughout their entire progression with Broward. And also for students who come into Broward, they can bring this kind of information into Broward and Broward can correctly place them in their own scope and sequence uh, and uh, complete the record from another school. So it really helps with those students who are transitioning from one school system to another. So that's about uh, you know all I have. I mean, this is the basic structure of the record. You have a nested set of assertions that are published by a set of known publishers that are part of a trust network. Uh, so each of these uh, uh, asserters asserts that some student who hopefully has their own self-sovereign identity has achieved some skill as aligned to a competency framework at some proficiency level as defined by that competency framework with evidence of the test scores or the work product or whatever it is. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and pass the ball back to Greg to uh, pull this together. Yep, you muted, Greg. Wrong button. Dan, is there anything uh, that you wanted to go deeper on with that or should we just open it up to questions? I want to make sure people get a chance to ask questions because I have no idea where we're going to go. With uh, to go go with in, in terms of the questions. So there's so much in what Josh just laid out in terms yeah. of why are we doing that and then how are we doing that. Um, I think we'll be able to fold any additional points into the questions that come up. So. Yeah, I, I should I should uh, point out that you know we can instrument the uh, Canvas instance that that uh, Dan already has in place. We can create template courses for teachers that have that scope and sequence that we just showed. We can instrument the uh, grade book that they use to maintain the alignments to the case frameworks. So we have the basic underpinnings in place. And I say if we had the year between now and this time next year to have built out the frameworks and to build out those courses scope and sequences, uh, for Broward, the teachers today could just be implementing those courses and collecting that data right now. So Duncan, uh, do you have a, is there questions teed up or um, should I open it or call on anyone? Uh, yeah, yeah, so we have a, we have a few questions uh, just happened. So from Matt Gee, we've got who ends up being the first user of the CLR? So uh, that would be the CLR. <laughs> So I'm going to answer the question a little differently, Josh. So the CLR can't have a single first user. It is a form of exchange which involves multiple parties. The institution, in this case Broward County Public Schools, is the initial asserter. The student receives that assertion and then there must be a consuming or um, accepting institution on the other side. So we've stood up three verticals that we're trying to get to agree to use this business process to put it in the language one is k-12 the other is higher ed and the third is the private sector in theory and gordon put this in the chat right this should negate the ability for um or the requirement for accuplacement 
because people either have a sufficient amount of assertions or they don't, right? And now there's much more detail about what it is, not just a single score on an SAT. There's a lot more, much more fleshed out version, many more dimensions of representation about what a kid does. But that maps very well to hiring in the private sector. That maps very well to other forms of credit issuance, not just eligibility for credit bearing courses. The whole idea here is to move to true competency based and decoupling seat time from requirement. Um, this is about what I can know and can do and um, what my experience base is and then mapping that and consuming it so that a much more what I fear is um, you know, algorithmic bias, which is why we want to use this as a way to uh, encourage exchange without having it uh, totally determine outcomes. Great. Uh, so we've got another question here. Uh, thoughts on scalability beyond Broward or beyond Florida? Greg, that's a natural for you. Well, uh, and is Simone on here? And it, uh, he was on earlier here. Um, so, Simone. So, what is it? And it, it, is he turned on for audio? Here, I'll turn him on. Yeah. Simone, do you want, Simone, do you want to join in here in kind of the conversations we've been having with uh, the folks from uh, from Europe? And uh, we've also been talking with Sam O from Asia. But, Simone, are you there? Uh, let's see, he's unmuted, but. And Simone, you may have your Microphone phone. Issues. So j jump right in here, Simone, if you get your audio working. You know, I'll, you know, but. Sound check. Can you hear me now? Yes, Simone. Hi, yeah, welcome. Right. First Sorry of all, Simone, first of all, just maybe start by kind of same question. Dan, can you just say, you know, briefly from Italy, you know, is what Dan's talking about happening in Broward? Is that what's happening with the schools in Italy? And what is the what do you see as the applicability of this in Italy and 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 uh, wherever else your perspectives uh, go? I wish that was what what was happening in Italy as well. So I commend the approach and the reactiveness and you know what's happening. Obviously, I'm not across exactly you know deeply inside what's happening in each individual institutions, but uh, my feeling, having heard how the response was there Broward is that there is that could be a reference so kudos good luck amazing job um <laughs> I think there, there's hope on how things could be at least planned or you know or how to react to this situation and I don't think Italian universities are or, or school districts are you know engage or were able to react that way but i don't have all the evidence supporting my claim it's just a a good gut feeling and then simone so then more broadly do you want to just bring in the conversation around clr ilr and verifiable credentials and um i mean i think it's sort of a softball question right I mean, the answer is of course this is everywhere right yeah uh it's everywhere i think the the good news is that it's everywhere. The bad news is that it's everywhere, um, meaning that there is, you know, different initiatives aiming at the same thing or aiming at a comprehensive learner record uh, under different names. Uh, different jurisdictions internationally have started to do some work around it. Um, and what we have been trying to do within this group and across other groups is to add that um international scope to the conversation which naturally adds a layer of complexity but this is a global issue and we want to to have the ambition and, and the audacity to to look at it from that angle uh, and so we are moving some of the first steps in, in bringing in uh contributors from outside north america that can share what has been done in europe initially but you know, we have ways to extend that. Uh, but I know, I know personally, and have been involved in work uh, across the years that there is, you know, good stuff that has happened in Europe and needs to be put into a convergence uh, trajectory toward what's happening here. And what I just heard from the Broward scenario is, is impressive. 
in terms of just really seeing how this could, the different parts could play together. And so um, I really commend your effort. This could be a reference implementation that um, would provide some guidance for other that wants to, to just, you know, embark on this journey. And Simone, you know, when, uh, when I was with, with uh, Duncan and folks learning Economy Foundation in, uh, in, uh, at the blockchain thing in Switzerland, um, I was preparing for the trip with my son who accompanied me with it, and I, we had all of these, all these different plugs, <laughs> right? Yep. So why is it that we have all these different plugs, right? And the answer is because there wasn't international standardization, right? It's kind of a small, silly thing, but like, what if we could make this learning record environment international now first instead of doing it us and then doing it in europe what if we could get that around interoperability structures not for one big set of learning targets i don't think anyone thinks that that's possible but for a way for exchanging so that that you know this is not the best thing you know what our goal is is to get you know instead you know what duncan says which is uh, not duncan what um uh, drummond says which is this right and we want to be able to take this out and say, I got this from Broward. It says what I know about algebra. And then they go to your community, Simone in Italy, and they say, I'm gonna exchange this math competency credentials granular, the way that Joshua was talking about it, with the school that's now accepting me in Italy. And we'll make the translation in the way that we can with currency. And now the school or the learning environment in Italy or wherever else or the job or anything else that's downstream can consume that information in a way that makes sense to them, right? That's what we're all going for here with this. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else wants, I mean, that's what we're here for. I think everyone's agreed about that. If anyone wants to echo that or challenge it, or if there's other questions. Uh, I certainly agree with that because I presented that concept. Um, Dan, you know, uh, uh, Something else I think maybe we should share with this audience. Uh, one of the items that we have done for Broward is a connector inside of their Canvas tool for their special ed students. Uh, and it provides information to teachers for all the students in their class about which students need accommodations. Um, it could also easily be extended to address special ed objectives and goals because every student has an IEP has a set of personal objectives. So through that method, not only can we, in a, in a distance learning environment, support uh, teachers in addressing accommodations for students with special needs, we can also help special education teachers collect uh, performance information with regard to their IEP goals and objectives. Absolutely, which I think is a yeah. And so I did reference um, what you are referring to in the chat in some of my answers. A lot of people are doubtful that we're going to be able to, well, let me phrase it this way. A lot of people are concerned that our efforts, and in fact, all efforts at digital instruction are going to do nothing but exacerbate inequity. Mm. Um, there's a digital divide, but there's also the um, pedagogical divide of what kids need in order to uh, meet the common expectations which st educational standards Preside, uh, prevent, you know, provide to folks. Um, by working with our vendors, in this case, PCG for Ed Plan as our special education system, with the accommodations, we've been able to deliver those inside of the Canvas uh, roster or the grade book. You know, when a teacher looks at who's in the class, they see columns next to it that provide programmatic participation, not just for special education, but also for 504 accommodations, for response to intervention, for gifted status, for um, ESOL and bilingual status, and then link to uh, the IEP to pull down that particular student's one. By using IMS Global Standards for interoperability, that has been stood up due to tremendous work by the PCG team and working with the Canvas team to set that up. We have needed that more than ever because we can now tell every parent that every teacher that their kid has can see what that kid needs. We are currently in development at the final completion of that cycle, which is the ability of the teacher to assert that that accommodation has been provided. And that then shows the IEP team defines what the accommodations are. The teacher has it right in their gradebook for their lesson planning. The teacher asserts that that accommodation has been met 
and we then don't have these arguments about, well, my kid didn't get it. So we, we were working on the right stuff. You know, the, the virus wasn't as patient as we would have liked, but um, we're making the progress we can. Yeah, I'll reinforce that it's an impossible mission for teachers to provide those accommodations without a facilitative tool and interface like we've implemented in Canvas. By concentrating the point of engagement through Canvas and, and the information presentation for the teachers, we reduce the number of clicks involved in simply tracking that they're doing what they're supposed to do from hundreds to tens. Yep. Uh, so I notice we have one more, we have time for about one more short question. There's one in the chat. Uh, it's Dan, is Broward addressing student engagement beyond online attendance in any way? And are you instrumenting other ways that can identify or provide alerts of students at risk? So we do have uh, an alert system. It's an at-risk indicator. It is uh, calculated by a number of different factors. That includes grades and attendance and uh, prior performance, test performance, all those kinds of things. And then it provides an index that's scaled at one to 10. Um, we're gonna have to completely revisit that. Um, so the waiving of the state test results this year is gonna give us a gap in that. Um, we're gonna have to come up with some new algorithms, but what I have always felt is that the, the current systems are just too limited. They, they reduce our definition of learning to that which can be quantify, quantifiably measured through multiple choice tests. By moving to a broader assertion experience base, I want to be able to capture, has every kid had some kind of extracurricular experience? I don't care if it's cheerleading or math club, and maybe it's coming from the local church or the boys and girls club who's able to provide that assertion. Our job as the school is to focus on the human development side and the academic achievement. We need to open up and have exchange and honoring of scouts just like we do band. So I'll pause there because I know we're running short on time and I have a hard two o'clock with the USDOE. So. Well, Dan, tell them from all of us that we need their help and leadership. <laughs> I think they know that, right? Um, so Me and 10,000 other people will uh, echo that sentiment, Greg. <laughs> yeah. And so we elect you to be the new U.S. Secretary of Education and <laughs> provide the, that leadership for us all. Because I think, uh, uh, we don't, we don't I think there's bipartisan agreement that I would not be the right one. So. <laughs> uh, um, and um, thank you, everyone, for joining. And we'll be back in this format next month with C for Colorado. Great. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of this call on our YouTube channel and sending an email with everyone. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Be well. Be good. Bye-bye. Right.